Hello, everyone. Welcome to a webinar of the cybersecurity landscape in 2021 for a cyber risk lens. The webinar today is in partnership with Cyber Risk Management Group, CRMG, and Cavaris. I am Kirsty Donovan from CRMG, and I will be hosting the webinar today. So firstly, I'd like to give you a warm welcome and thank you for joining us. Before we dive into lots of great content, I will run through some housekeeping. Today's session will be a maximum of one hour, 45 minutes of presentation, and then we will leave 15 minutes at the end for questions, which we encourage you to submit throughout the presentation through the Zoom console, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. We will also be running polls, which will pop up on your screen, so please take your time to answer them. Finally, this webinar is being recorded, and we will send the on-demand video in the next, in the next few days via email. So, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Firstly, we have Nick Frost. Hello, thanks Kirsty. Hello everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, that's great to see you here. Uh, so a bit of background to me. Um, I've worked in the whole cyber risk piece for the well, I mean, best part of 20 years now. Uh, most of which have been spent between organizations such as Cable and Wireless, PwC, uh, the Information Security Forum before uh, we started uh, at CRMG, of which I'm a co-founder. So hopefully bring a lot of these insights that uh, that I picked up personally and, uh, and also the rest of the CRMG team. Thanks, Nick. And our second speaker, we have Michael Bonal, founder and CEO at Cavaris. Hi, Kirsty. Thanks for that. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Mike, um, founder and CEO of Cavaris. Um, I've been in infrastructure management for the best part of 30 odd years, predominantly banking, the service provider and telcos. Uh, in the early 2000s, I was a uh, network security officer at Deutsche Bank. And my role there was uh, making sure that our networks across the mirror were secure and also interfacing with audit. Um, for the last 15 odd years, I've been developing software for the likes of BT and Vodafone. And the camera solution was sort of founded, I guess, upon the sort of experiences I had at Deutsche Bank. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Michael. And last but not least, um, Lee Edge, Director at GRC Edge Consulting. Hi, everybody. My name's Lee Edge. I'm brief history of myself, helicopter view, 12 years at PricewaterhouseCoopers, starting at IT audit all the way through to implementations, pre and post reviews, and then moved to KPMG for two years before going vendor side and to the dark side for six years working with GRC vendors. Uh, currently working um, on projects on operational resilience and looking forward to speaking to you. To you later on. Thanks, Lee. So as you can see, lots of great experience and insights to share today. So I won't take up any more time and I'm gonna hand you over to Nick Frost of CRMG. He'll be covering shifting from a compliance to a risk-based approach to cybersecurity. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, yeah, so this is this is something that we at CRMG um, we're coming across this desire from a number of our clients to shift from a, a much more compliance-based approach to security, which I think has been inherent for quite some time now, to one that's more risk-based. Um, and it's uh, it's something I'm going to talk about um, and and look at the kind of the pros and cons, if you like, between both those types of approaches. But what I wanted to do first is just take a little bit uh, of a trip down memory lane, because I think it's important to try and set the scene and understand wh why cyber risk based approaches, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, but why they are, are necessary for, for today's you know, security protection of data and our critical assets. Um, so what I want to start off with, uh, for those of you that, uh, <laughs> that may not have been around, you know, 30 years ago, uh, cybersecurity wasn't actually even a word. It was, it was probably called IT security or computer security. Um, and what we were seeing back there then were attacks that really weren't that substantial. Um, they were driven really by notoriety. So there was this sort of new sort of community of hackers at the time. And, you know, people wanted to make a bit of a name for themselves on the underground networks and things like that and the bulletin boards. Um, and I guess also our dependency on, on IT systems and, and, and networks at the time wasn't as, wasn't as significant as it is today. Um, but what we started to see about 10 years later, um, certainly driven by the media attention, was 
you know, were some fairly high profile uh, attacks, if you like. Um, you know, there's a corner cover, uh, I love you virus. There was code red as well. That was fairly significant at the time, taking out a range of different uh, Microsoft servers. And this is where we started to see quite a significant shift because I think, you know, from the criminal gangs perspective, they started to see actually how vulnerable individuals were, us as humans, um, but also how vulnerable, you know, networks and computer security at the time was as well. And so come, you know, moving on 10 years later, then we started to see uh, quite a significant shift in ability of sophistication, uh, frequency, different attack types. Um, and the smarter organized gangs were starting to, you know, uh, invest a lot of their, uh, their financial gains back in and to develop these more sophisticated type of attacks. And it, at this point, it certainly felt like it was, it was becoming a, I use an analogy of a war on drugs. You know, you always felt uh, in charge of security functions, you always felt that you were trying to, uh, trying to anticipate what type of attack would come next and, and who would attack you. Um, and today, of course, you know, that's only sort of uh, growing it, if you like, in terms of um, our, our exposure and in terms of the types of attacks coming forward. And of course, now, um, you know, we're seeing uh, nation state attacks uh, on the rise. We're also seeing earlier this year, the largest in our service attack that hit Amazon Web Service. So, you know, a lot of these types of attacks, um, they're not going away. Um, and I think there's a general need to take a real different approach to how we can better uh, identify our threat landscape and, and what types of key controls uh, we need to be putting in place to be able to help mitigate those types of attacks. And, you know, be under no illusion, when this is not going to be the perfect silver bullet, um, but there are approaches that I'll briefly talk about that we can start to take to be able to be in a much stronger position. So if we go to the next slide, Kirsty. Um, one of the things I think is probably worth highlighting here, and of course this is this is a, a every every year the World Economic Forum uh, produce these uh, these risk reports, if you like, these global risk reports, and it's been certainly been on our radar at CRNG for quite a while. These organisations of stature, you know, are starting to pick up on these cyber attacks, if you like, in their risk reports. And if you look back over the past, you know, four years, you know, we started to see cyber attacks appearing and actually the sort of upper right-hand quadrant where you've got impact on the vertical axis and likelihood on, on the bottom. So a traditional sort of risk template that's used. Um, and then when you go to 2017 and 2018, the same types of positions and even 2019 you know, the same position of those cyber attacks uh, still maintains that sort of that position. And, you know, we're up there, if you like, in terms of cyber attacks, we're up there with, you know, environmental change. So it's a fairly significant uh, global risk that's being picked up by organizations like, you know, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the UN, nothing's different. So, you know, this is a big problem. And uh, hopefully today, the three of us are going to give you some ideas in terms of what good practice looks like and what we see will mature and materialize in 2021. So let's, let's move forward and just take a quick look at what compliance-based approaches are and what their strengths and weaknesses. Because, you know, when I first started in, in, in information security, um, it was very heavily driven by a compliance-based approach. And it was probably fit for purpose by then. Um, you know, it was important to understand how well we aligned to standards, industry standards of best practice, good practice, whether it's ISO, NIST, or whatever it may well be. Um, it was actually also fairly straightforward to follow. So you didn't have to be, you know, an expert in this area. Uh, yes, you have to have an audit mindset. And you had to be able to understand what types of test procedures to ensure that you were, you know, testing uh, the applicability of certain controls. But the, I suppose the one challenge that I always recall, um, as we started to, over time, as we started to continue to do these kind of compliance audits, 
was very much a case of prove to me why I need this control. You know, there is no sort of argument to be able to tell me that this control is stopping these types of problems occurring. And so this started to grow uh, into a fairly, you know, strong trend that, um, you know, for myself started to indicate maybe compliance based approaches for, for cybersecurity aren't as good as we think they are. Um, the limitations were, were pretty clear. Um, it's often uh, typical that you apply, you know, one set of controls across uh, an entire organization. Um, and what we tended to see actually was less of, less a case of under engineering of controls, but over engineering. So, you know, organizations were spending excessive amounts um, on security related controls without really understanding what the risk profile was for their organization. So what we started to see, I suppose, over the past sort of five years was a real desire, not just to talk about a, a risk based approach to security, but actually to start driving towards one. And that's something that, uh, that we at CRMG are heavily, heavily involved in. And so there are lots of benefits for achieving uh, a risk based approach, both from a cybersecurity perspective, but also from a business perspective. You know, you can have that evidential information. You can have that strength and argument to determine which controls are needed, why they're needed. Um, it is true. I, I've, I've witnessed many times in, in, in my career that risk is a much better understood word uh, across the business than we often think it is. They may not look at assessing risk in the same rigorous manner that we do, but the term risk and the the natural sort of concepts to risk in terms of the impact, what could go wrong and likelihood, what are the chances of things going wrong is very well understood. So this is a, I suppose you could say, this is a, an, an approach that we, uh, that we typically see being used across uh, industry and in a lot of organizations. Um, I wasn't gonna go through this in detail, but what is certainly key with any approach is it's, re it's something that you can repeat uh, it's something that stands up to scrutiny. Um, it embeds all of those key principles of a cyber risk assessment. Whether you're looking at this from a qualitative or a quantitative perspective, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you have the ability to be able to identify, you know, what types of consequences could occur to the business in terms of reputational damage, in terms of fines uh, and legal penalties. Uh, and then also to understand the extent to which you're exposed to, you know, to, to sort of key threats uh, in the cyber threat landscape. Um, with the controls in place, obviously, you can start to assess, well, what is our strength? What is our capability to be able to prevent those types of threats from occurring? And what's our ability to be able to mitigate them? You'll never eradicate them, but you can start to build in defenses that can detect uh, cyber threats as they occur and uh, responsive controls to help minimize uh, the impact as a result of an attack. So, you know, they're, they're, they're the sort of key components to be able to understand and evaluate what your cyber risk profile looks like. But be under no illusion, um, when you come to communicate and report uh, your risk results or your cyber risk profile, this is something I feel is, is often uh, underrated. Um, and it's something we see quite often, whereby you go through all of this hard work, we're carrying out your cyber risk assessments, hand the risk report to, to somebody in the business, uh, and it's not often followed up or monitored. So that continual cyber risk reporting, both in terms of what does the risk landscape look like, because it is dynamic, it will change, but also clear understanding around monitoring of the controls is, is absolutely vital to ensure we've got in place. And move on to the next slide, Kirsty. And I think that's the, the key point to any cyber risk assessment here is, number one, we need to understand what our cyber risks are, and you'll have to prioritize those. You will not be able to achieve and address all of those cyber risks, even if you had the resources and the money to do so. This is really all about taking a sensible approach, a pragmatic approach to determining what are the key risks that we need to mitigate against our mission critical systems. And what are the, what are the vital controls that will ensure that those risks are being monitored 
uh, and being mitigated against. And it's that continual control monitoring that is going to become a key part uh, for the overall cyber risk management picture um, in 2021. And this is probably where I hand off that control monitoring piece now to, to Michael. Yep, but first of all, Nick, we're just going to do um, our first poll. Um, so hopefully everybody should see it now on their screen. So to what extent is your organization following a risk-based approach to cybersecurity? So this is just kind of taking a temperature of the audience in relation to um, all the good information Nick's just shared. We'll just give it one more minute to think most it in. Okay, so we've got 63% saying regularly, 21% saying sometimes, five very infrequently, and 11% not at all. Is that kind of what you're expecting, Nick? Yeah, that's really positive to see. That's probably the highest uh, percentage rating um, that I've seen. So that, that's a real positive sign. I think there's, that's certainly a good indication um, for organizations to now, you know, to, to, for us to move from that 63% to a higher percentage, but that's very positive to see. Great stuff. Um, and I'm now going to hand you over to Michael from Cabarrus on Proactive Cybersecurity Challenge at the Coalface. Thanks, Thanks Michael. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks for that, Nick. So I'm going to talk about proactive cybersecurity at the Coalface. And by the Coalface, I mean the actual technology. Sorry, if we go back a touch, Kirsty, the other slide. So by the Coalface, I mean actual technology and operations because Policy is nice, but uh, security is actually carried out at the gold face. Proactive, because we want to, sorry, back again. <laughs> Proactive, because we want to prevent. Uh, so this is very much preventative. And as Nick mentioned, um, control selection, because that control selection needs to be influenced by risk management. Thank you. Move forward, please, Cyber. Kirsty. So just uh, a brief sort of uh, history lesson again, <laughs> very brief. So uh, if we think back to sort of medieval days with the, the castle and the Castellan and security guards, then uh, really sort of security was pretty, pretty simple. Uh, there weren't many ingress points, maybe one, but um, maybe a few, but very minor. And breaking attempts were pretty infrequent. If we fast forward to, say, the office block of the sort of second half of the 20th century, then head of security and guards were responsible for protecting that sort of office block from break-in and theft, et cetera. Again, very few ingress points and pretty sort of infrequent break-in attempts. Now we fast forward to sort of the 21st century and the, uh, the security officer and his team of the sort of modern organization. Then we're literally told we've got potentially sort of thousands of break-in points, entry points, and these aren't always visible, like the sort of old doors and windows that we could visually easily visualize. Often these are sort of obscured through technology, very difficult to sort of see. And potential break-in attempts are astounding. So anybody who sort of uh, looked at ser servers, online public hosting servers, will see the sort of continuous knock on the door by these automated bots. And so really we're talking about staggering numbers. And so I, I talk about security officer as a sort of plate spinner because he's trying to make sure he's spinning all of these plates without dropping any, which is obviously a catastrophe. Okay, Kirsty, forward, please. So really the cyber criminals have the advantage today. Uh, we can see that cyber crime is growing. We see this in the press week in, week out. And this is actually in spite of significant spending over the last few years. And uh, boards are starting to push back now and they're starting to demand uh, improved, uh, improved data uh, as to sort of where that spend has gone and also to allow them to make uh, objective and, uh, and, and useful, uh, uh, excuse me, objective, uh, be, be, sorry, objective um, uh, recommendations, sorry. Uh, we're also seeing exposures are increasing and you and I as consumers are sort of driving that through sort of our insatiable appetite for sort of online services and technologies. And these technology infrastructures are under significant, significant strain. Immense change is happening. And with this change, the opportunity to introduce uh, vulnerabilities just is really ramping up. 
And those vulnerabilities can become exposures, of course. And these are typically through misconfiguration, uh, sort of malpractice, or, or even just sort of poor code. But the opportunities to expose these, uh, to, to have these exposures is increasing. If that wasn't enough, then cyber criminals are starting to adopt uh, AI, ML, and uh, automation. And their, uh, and their attacks are becoming more sophisticated and devious. And the, the, uh, the, the example I have here is the Herjavec estimate of successful ransomware attacks uh, only in 2021, which is only a few weeks away, once every 11 seconds. And to me, that's pretty staggering and is uh, painting a picture of widespread automation. Um, if we look at uh, the criminals, and as I said, the odds are stacked in favour of the criminals. Um, the, the business is a bit like a sort of defence uh, in football. So they have to act as a unit. They have to go up the field and back the field as a unit, i.e. the order and structure there. And they've got to be concentrated and focused for the whole of the time. Yeah, in a football game, it's 90 minutes. In business, it's all of the time, and they can't make any mistakes. The cyber criminal or the striker only needs to be lucky once. And so the, the, the odds are really stacked massively against business. And then if you think about the anonymity afforded by the internet, and the sort of likelihood of being caught is virtually zero, and the upsides are potentially vast. There's a, there's a lot to like if you're a cyber criminal. Then if we think about things like manual attestation, which is sort of the typical way that we have done the sort of checking to make sure security is enforced, whether at the technology level or at the operations level, we can't really sort of carry on in that way because humans are not very good at doing this sort of uh, detection, especially at the automated level. We forget things, we don't do things correctly, etc. And then finally, avoidable causes. So uh, based upon the sort of Verizon data risk reach report, something like 75% of security incidents are attributable to sort of inconsistent application of basic security hygiene factors. This is patching servers. This is removing levers from, uh, from systems when they've off been offloaded, etc. So I think the, the sort of takeaway from this is that uh, the odds are heavily stacked against business and in favour of cyber criminals. Okay, can we skip to the next slide, please? So, why is information security, cyber security, so difficult to manage? So, uh, when I was at uh, Deutsche Bank, then I was responsible for about eight or ten networks across the MIA, and I wanted to make sure that these types of controls, these checks, were being performed, and they're performed typically on sort of different frequencies. And I wasn't necessarily doing all of those, but I was making sure that they were done. So if we look at, say, account creation, for example, and, and drill into that, then I'd want to make sure that uh, privileged accounts were subject to risk acceptance. And then every account was uh, authorised prior to creation and also subject to a formal change request. Thanks, uh, Kirsty. And these are sort of typical manual attestation type tasks. If we think about things like uh, passwords, for example, then we want to check that the password attributes in the authentication systems are correct because it's all too easy to misconfigure something. It's all too easy to turn a password sort of attribute off when you're troubleshooting and forget to turn it back on again. And if we do that, then effectively we're sort of uh, opening the doors and the windows to the bad guys. And these are sort of prime candidates for automation because, as I said before, humans aren't very good at doing these mundane repetitive tasks. They forget to do them. They don't do them correctly. They don't do them completely. And really, at the frequency that we need to be doing these, yeah, humans just can't, they haven't got the bandwidth to do that. So we really need to look at automation for these types of checks. Okay, if we go back to the... Uh, so if we add in access uh, control monitoring here, so another, another set of checks, a discipline. Sorry, can you just pop back it's touched, Kirsty. Then we're suddenly up to 50, 55 controls. Okay. And then if we add, if we look at all of the technology disciplines that we need to enforce across a technology infrastructure, we can easily reach five or 600 controls. So this is getting potentially quite large. So now if we extrapolate that across an organization to the next slide, please, Kirsty. And this is a single infrastructure here, okay, for a largest organization and a single geography, excuse me, I stress again, single geography, multiple network estates, multiple server estates, other technology estates, could be mobile phones, what have you, uh, take into consideration things like HR, so they've got to screen employees, but have disciplinary processes in place, uh, supply chain, third party contracts, et cetera, 
then we can very easily reach tens of thousands of low level security controls. And this is really scary. And the key message here is that complexity and scalability is the enemy of security. And I'll often say, look, I can manage five or 10 or 20 servers, but even with a team managing 50, 100, 500, 1,000 becomes incredibly challenging. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. Some of that information is pretty staggering. Um, and just following on from that, we're going to launch our second poll. So to what extent is your organization using proactive automation to strengthen cybersecurity? Not using and not no plans to use? Not using plans to use in the next year? Just started using or you've been using for over a year? So it looks like we have most of your answers in. Just take a few more. Okay, so the results show 32% not using and you have no plans to use. 32% not using, but you plan to use in the next year. 18% just started using and 18% have been using um, over a year. Michael, any comment on that based on what you were discussing? Uh, no, I think that's fairly representative. I think uh, most people are sort of more familiar with sort of reactive security at a saw. And I think sort of preventative automation, sorry, reactive automation, I think preventative automation is, is newer. So yeah, that looks pretty, pretty right. Okay, great. So I'm now going to pass it over to our final speaker, Lee, who's going to be talking on agility on the edge of chaos. Hi, everybody. First of all, you'll have to excuse the pun on my surname. It wasn't intentional, but um, we'll come back to that at the end of the slides. So first of all, if we just move on to the as is and to be. So I use this slide quite a lot in, in most of my presentations. It's an OSEG diagram, I think from 2011, 12. But all I'm really going to talk to here is the, the silo chaos on the left hand side of your screen. Every company I've spoken with since my early days at PwC in 2000, up until recently are all left-hand side in one way or another in silo chaos, fragmented, complex, old you know, architecture um, and you know, disgruntled teams really. And we're all trying to move to that right-hand side which is constantly on wheels moving away from us as technology develops. And obviously with the FinTechs and the RegTechs and you know, the blockchain, all these, thing, all these things that are gonna add to the ability for these hackers to get in, be it external or, or internal. So we're, we're moving from the left, we're all trying to get to the right. So, so how do we do that really? How do we reduce that duplication of effort? So if we go on to very quickly, um, I haven't got a slide on this, I didn't want to inundate you with too many slides, but there was an, an area that I developed around Darwin's evolution of um, mm. non-compliance. It's really no company is, is wrong to be in that place on that left-hand side of that diagram. It's a natural evolution from, from the, the creation of a company that's all aligned with its governance frameworks and its risk frameworks. But as that business changes and it adapts to the market, those processes and those controls change and that employment base or you know, the employees find ways of circumventing those to make their day jobs more efficient. So it's a natural place to be. It's not a negative place to be, but we do have to work to get ourselves out of that. So if we move on to costs, cost of compliance, Again, there's a lot of data on here and I should have stripped some of this out, but all this slide is saying is you need to understand how many controls you have across your business. If we're talking one example on there, 10,000 controls, that's a wider control suite, but you've also got the key controls rationalization as well. So there's two areas you should really have a grasp of. And I tend to add a figure of say 500 pounds, you know, it, it's really just one of those. Um, fingers, fingers in the air to give you some valuation to, to really work on an understanding of, of how much money you're spending across your control network or control landscape, sorry, and how much you can save by reducing that duplication of effort, stripping out those mundane tasks that could be automated, but also not even reviewing some of those controls that are happening in the wider landscape because they're actually mitigated by key controls at a higher level. And this is something, you know, within PwC and, and KPMG, we spent a lot of time educating customers on. And I feel still in the market, this hasn't really been grasped and aligned to the, the central risk register. So all it is, is turning from a limited 
uh, to a defined, to an optimized, it says their operational risk environment, but in our sense, you know, an IT security cyber risk environment. Uh, I could talk many days about that, but we'll move on to, uh, to how do you address that? Where do you begin to work to, to address that cost of compliance? This is something I drew while I was at KPMG, actually, on, on the back of a fag packet. Not that I smoke, bad for you. But uh, in terms of strategic, tactical, and operational. So many people are doing siloed implementations and you know, how are we achieving our business process and IT controls at an operational level? And some are pulled up to the internal audit level from a tactical side by the internal audit and maybe the external audit reports as well. But you should really be knowing why you're doing these siloed implementations and making sure they're not siloed, um, pardon me, and, and aligning them to the strategic goal of the company from a risk environment level. So the boardroom and you know, the C-suite and you know, senior management should be looking out at the wider internal risk environment, but also that external IT risk environment and bringing that strategy uh, aligned across you know, the risk in a boardroom mentality, what's the proactive risk approach they're taking, are you ensuring against some of those risks or are you trying to mitigate all of them? And then funneling that down to uh, the pillars of compliance so your operational risk team, your, inter, you know, your controls, internal controls systems team, or your enterprise wide risk as well. So it's really just to focus on making sure your projects are aligned continuously, uh, almost as if it was an organic, um, or, sorry, an organism constantly evolving and you know, responding to, to st strategic approaches and making sure you know why you're doing things at the lower level. That'll also help team morale because they'll know what they're actually doing the work for and it'll be a collective culture that are working to go forward together. So how do you address the problems that are really out there now currently in your businesses? So we can move on to the next one. Uh, actually before we get on to this one there's one again that I didn't want to inundate you with with an extra slide but I call it Plato's allegory of a cave so I've got Darwin in and I've got Plato in now. But in terms of, you know, don't believe the shadows that are cast by the, your fires that are burning out there in your business. You know, really get out there and understand what the problems are and, and review in detail. You know, don't listen to those dashboard reports or um, rag reports that you're getting that say everything's green. Get out there and really kick some tires for, for adding as many analogies as I can there. But there's a change in culture that's needed. And really that the A cave bit is automation, collaboration, accountability with the senior manager regime and efficiency and the V's for validity. So you've really got to get out there and think about how you can implement that within your culture. And this slide here is just something that I tend to talk to that if we're talking today on an IT security risk or a digital risk use case or a focus, that's your destination. And in order to get to that destination, you really need to manage the right hand side of, of or the second compass wheel there around the risk headwind that's always going to be, you know, hitting your boat, if you want to use that kind of analogy. But, um, you, you know, your strategic point, again, your oversight from the regulators, your processes that you really want to protect from a, from a cyber level. You know, what are the key systems that you're protecting and what are the systems you don't really have to bring online as quick as the other ones? or don't have to bring online at all to function as a business. You've got people with a culture and how you embed that throughout to make sure that they are actually responding to doing the security training and, you know, and being aware and, and spotting any incidents in the office and reporting those. And obviously there's the technology element, which is, have you got technology in? Is it appropriate? Is it antiquated? Have you got too many? And are they repetitive and you know, is there gaps from a control risk and regulatory perspective? Those are the areas, there's many areas you need to focus on, but those are the areas you should, you should really be putting your arms around. So if we move on to the future, I think we're getting close to, to the end of my time, but again, this is probably more complicated than I wanted this slide to be. But what we're talking here is we're putting ourselves in the shoes of maybe Arthur C. Clarke, or Philip K. Dick or William Gibson, right? We're, we're trying to be futurists. So what is the next five, 10 years gonna be from an IT security risk, digital risk or, or a cyber risk perspective, depending on the, the taxonomy that you use internally? Well, you've got machine learning, which is being spoken about a lot, and you've got AI. You know, they're wrapped around the FinTech, RegTech and the new 
supervisory tech, sub tech, if I can say it, that's out there as well, that's coming out there. Um, and this is where the proactive risk is moving. Uh, you know, we, I can see, you know, IT risk as a service, service being something that's going to be coming about very soon. And a lot of fintechs and regtechs are moving that way. But also, you know, to my call and to Nick's talks, you have real continuous controls monitoring. We were talking about this even as a graduate in 2000 with PwC, and it's still not really happening out there. And technology is now, or has now caught up, and there is an ability to, you know, to dovetail in your IT security controls within an existing GRC solution or future uh, FinTech or RedTech solutions um, that are out there, or that you can take um, you know, an IT risk system to do that for you, but the ability is there now, uh, you know, um, make sure you do your due diligence because, you know, any companies that are really pushing AI and machine learning at the minute, I'm sure everyone on this call is more than aware that that probably isn't really happening as much as they're saying it is. So, you know, I caution that initially, but back to, you know, the, the, the living organism that I mentioned, that's the way I could see things moving. So, the chaos element is most of the clients I've seen and work with and speak to are all in clouds of chaos. And the real, uh, well, the real key to this is not really going all, all out and getting to accord and, and clarity in that control box, because that's nigh on impossible for a company that's out there and, and trying to you know, be a leader in the market, not be in the zone of organizational, organizational power with an illusion of alignment not being zone of strategic power, which has an illusion of foresight, but really being in that agile space, which is outside of that chaos, where you're able to you know, choose what you want to do in a proactive IT risk and wider risk remit, and being able to, you know, to pivot quicker than your competitors out there and really work hard as an IT and a CISO team to, to protect your company and allow it to move and, and pivot as much as possible. So really that's all I wanted to touch on today around um, where we are in siloed chaos and where I see the future going. I know there's a poll question coming and we have some time for uh, a Q&A session, so I won't go on any longer and I'll hand back to Kirsty. Yes, thank you for that, Lee. So I'm just gonna dive straight into the next poll question and the final poll question. So how would you rate your organization's maturity in regards to cybersecurity controls? very mature, good, intermediate, or basic? Yeah, and, and just while everyone's Again, just responding. giving a few moments here. So far, it's looking like most people are saying um, good. Hello, Kirsty, can you hear me? Yep. I just so, wanted... Oh, sorry, go on, Lee. No, it's right. I was just wanting to add some flavor to that. They may have already uh, answered the questions anyway. Well, that was really from a key control, an understanding of the key controls within the business, you know, adding the cost to it. Do they know how much that is costing? Uh, have they got an understanding of the wider controls um, and really getting their arms around uh, the, you know, that risk and control landscape? So I probably should have said that at the start. And on that slide that I mentioned to earlier, um, there was some examples of how much return on investment you can, you can save by stripping out those redundant controls. But well, there, there's some great results. You know, I did say to the to the, uh, the team before we started this con this call that I and you correct me if I'm wrong, Kirsty, but I did say most people would say good uh, or intermediate. Um, I question. I'm not calling anyone out on being liars at all on this call, so that's not what I'm saying. But um, but I would question if we got under the hoods there, if if it was as high as as those figures we have there. But um, that's just in my experience. You, everyone on the call might be super. Uh, super experienced and have everything in, you know, in place at their companies. But uh, maybe we can go into that more details in the Q&A. Yeah, th thank you for that, Lee. So um, now we're going to move into the Q&A with the remaining time we have. So the first question I have here is from Phil. The importance of getting a conversation started around cyber, how to, to defeat social engineering through internal conversations to defeat phishing type attacks. Nick, okay. would you take that one? Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> this is going to be probably more art than science, if I'm honest with you. I mean, so I'll, I'll tell you how how I've managed to um, 
help. I wouldn't say we've achieved the perfect result, but how, how I've managed to sort of achieve, a, a, I suppose, a level of interest and, and get a dialogue going, if you like, um, with, with senior management. Um, number one, um, it's often what, so the, the approach we took basically was that um, we established a, a cyber risk review committee. Um, and on that committee, we had um, individuals, head of legal, had a senior partner, individuals that um, that knew and got cyber risk. They understood that this was a, you know, this was a new risk discipline. Um, they understood that it was a growing concern. Um, and they also understood that to be able to translate this to the senior leadership team, um, it wasn't going to be successful if people in the security function were to do that. Now, this is this is going back 10 years. So we use this review committee basically as the as the vehicle to translate what we were telling them um, so they could push that up to the senior leadership team. Um, that would be one specific um, suggestion, I would say. Um, I, th I think that question around the whole fishing piece, it it's a real concern at the minute. Um, I know speaking with a lot of our clients that you know, the the risk profile in the home working environment is is, is a key concern um, because they feel that the nature of um, phishing attacks and uh, and users working from home are a little bit more laissez faire about how they you know how they open emails or or sites they may go to whatever it is. Um, and we have seen you know it's not just me saying this, but there's a stack of data out there that since we went into lockdown, phishing attacks have gone through the roof. Um, but um, so I think I think the 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 suggestion around getting that conversation going, if you're not establishing a successful uh, conversation and dialogue yourself, then I would bring in the support from individuals that uh, that liaise with stakeholders and executives in the business to to help you out first time around. OK, thanks for that, Nick. Um, and I'll move on to the second question. So this one is on the importance of DNS control, personal use, PI hole, corporate, Cloudflare. <laughs> Cloudflare. Um, that sounds something uh, maybe for you, Mike. Yeah, I'll probably sort of um, take that one. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, uh, my, my sort of answer for these um, typically is that technology alone never provides security. And um, I give examples uh, typically of sort of account management, for example, where you have to do user recertification, you've got to do follow ups when uh, access to failed login attempts or out of bounds sort of access circumventing authentication controls. Uh, another example could be sort of firewall rules and the requirement to recertify firewall rules and such like. So I think it's really important to address security from a holistic perspective. And uh, that's no different to the sort of um, technical sort of uh, entities that uh, you sort of give examples of here as to the people, the process and the technology. And there have to be controls that address all of those aspects, whether it's uh, DNS controls, sort of identifying those uh, DNS servers and the, uh, uh, the appropriate sort of endpoints and making sure they're correctly managed. But it's also uh, the technology aspects as well. And it is key to have those automated technology sort of checks, but they've got to be part of a wider holistic people and process uh, approach as well. Hopefully that answers Phil's question there. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, the next one is anonymous. So which element of risk management do the panelists feel is at least well understood and implemented? For me, it's always been threat. It's something that tends to get skimmed over in many organizations and threat strength is even less well understood. Is this something others see too? Do you, want, do you want me to take that one? I, I was yep. looking at the IoT one. I was quite excited by that one. But this, you know, this one probably lends itself to more to my experience in the wider GRC. So, you know, I have and do work in IT risk, but you know, in terms of being a technical individual that's been out there in the position that, that Michael has in DB, you know, I haven't performed those roles. But from a wider risk management perspective, um, I think, you know, threat is a good one, but in, in terms of just the basics around, you know, access controls, you know, um, and the wider IT security risk use case itself, I don't think is fully understood by the boards full stop. Um, the conversation between the IT department and the, the board has got better over the last five years, I'd say, as technology has been, become more prev you know, prevalent within the boardroom. 
especially with Operation Resilience now and, you know, the um, lifting up of the BCM kind of uh, remit to, to be in equal, if not, you know, more important than operational risk, um, has brought it into the boards. But I think the full understanding of, of how, the, um, how the systems support those processes, Sarbanes-Oxley, I don't know if that's a swear word for anyone else out there, but, you know, going through that understanding of all your business processes, where your key systems are, how the IT controls underpin all of those, and, you know, and safety that that gives to those systems, you know, understanding and detecting if you've had somebody in your systems. You know, I worked RSA security, which I missed from my intro actually for four years and worked with the, um, the central team that worked across data loss prevention, fraud, you know, the net witness, or, and, and obviously the secure ID and how we leverage the technology within that area, within the GRC um, data as well. But, you know, it's, it's a very difficult topic to, you know, to communicate to the board. I think it's changing, but I think the IoT specifically and the external third party threats are um, the key ones. That's a long answer to the anonymous attendee, but hopefully it gave some insight. No, that's great. And Nick or Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I think um, if it's okay, <clears throat> if I go first, Mike, I think the the the, the anonymous attendee there is, is is identified something I completely agree with. And um, I think if you were to unpack this this term of risk management or risk and look at the components, you know, you have you have your controls, which as Lee mentioned, you know, they're pretty well understood. You can gain a, a fairly objective assessment about what controls you've got in place, how effective they're they're operating. Um, the impact and assessing impact and articulating impact is an area I've seen strengthen very much so over the past 10 years. Um, and, you know, business impact assessments offer that nice sort of bridge between security and the business because, you know, you're articulating and discussing and going through scenarios in term that highlight the types of consequences that can happen. And in my experience, a business always feel quite, you know, feel a key part of that. They feel they they have quite a lot to say, which is great. But you're absolutely right. When it comes to threat and understanding the threat, it is a, it is tough to do. Uh, it, by the way, it's not. I don't think it's an excuse not to do it. Um, but there are key questions that that I think we all struggle to be able to answer. Um, who's a, who's interested in attacking our organisation, um, and what types of techniques would they use, and 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 what is their capability? These are all questions that would if we had those answers to would really help enable us identify you know the, the mitigating actions to, to put in place um, the one thing I think there's a saving grace though in, in certainly in my experience is that when you're assessing your threats um, you know always remember that those adversarial groups out there they always have a finite amount of resources and a finite amount of time so um, so they're not going to be able to attack, you know, every organization with the same level of, you know, capability. The trick here is making sure that we've just got, you know, adequate level of controls in place that, um, that stops them being interested, you know, in you as an organization to attack. Um, there's quite a bit of feedback on the line at the minute. Paul, I think it's, if you can go on mute. Somebody's having some toast, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so hopefully that answered that one anyway. Uh, and Mike, I, th I think you were going to say something on this, or would you like me to move on to the next question? No, 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 I'm fine, thanks. Move on, please. Uh, no worries. And um, Lee, I know you said you were keen to answer the IoT question. So uh, lastly, the elephant in the room. Almost every IoT device has an entry point, and most are hard, if not impossible, to update. How much of risk is this? Yeah, th this one is, is an interesting one because... What I didn't mention again, and it sounds like I didn't do a great introduction because I didn't mention anything, but you know, I, I run a, a peer group network that everyone on this call is welcome to join. And um, you know, my fellow presenters are all part of it as well, but it's the GRC Supper Club, which I've run for the last six years. And one of the events we did was um, on IoT and GDPR actually, uh, you know, and how, how those are gonna impact the market going forward and you know, how you manage the data on your IoT devices, Never mind, you know, the, the hackers getting into those. So without getting too technical into it, but you know, how much of a risk is this? This is the biggest risk out there. If you want to get involved in IoT, I work with Philips Lighting 
uh, when I was doing some consulting, when they have their light bulbs that are all IoT devices, they connect Wi-Fi through the light bulbs and you can control your light bulbs, all these you know, spangly things. But in terms of getting access to those or you know, putting a third party solution within your home, it's much like all you guys and girls out there that are working with third party companies within your IT suite, whether you're doing a SaaS service or you're working with data centers that don't give you their audit results because it's part of the contract for them not to show you what the results were uh, and all these things, right? Um, it's the same as putting a ball in your house. If unless you can get some risk coverage over that third party or that fourth party, you're always going to be exposed there and it should be on your risk agenda as being a high risk. How can we go about reducing or mitigating that risk? The next point on Michael's points. Um, I'm, less, I'm less sure um, that we're going to be able to achieve that um, in the short term. When they first go in, it's like an Apple phone when it's, you know, it's the first incarnation that there's going to be loads of loopholes and gaps that can be exploited. So there's going to be, have to be something that um, those firms push out with these IoT devices that provide some comfort. Maybe they're ring fenced from your central system if you're going to push out a, a fully smart home. But um, there's definitely some, you know, some um, opportunities for companies out there to close these gaps because I've seen them since day one at PwC. No one's got a grasp of their third parties. Not many of the third parties are anywhere near your standards internally. Um, and you're only as strong as your weakest link, as the old adage goes, right? Guys, do you, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, it's Mike here. So, um, I mean, it's definitely, there's, there's a number of uh, sort of areas of interest here, concern, I guess. Scalability, so we're talking about significant numbers of um, uh, IoT devices probably even at a scale that uh, the telcos of this world are not sort of familiar with. And we're talking about possibly millions or tens of millions of interfaces in their environments. So we're talking about larger scale than that. Um, we're talking about a lot of insecure protocols. So having done some IoT development, I'm fully aware of those uh, insecure protocols. And it's, it's gonna be a real challenge. Um, I, I, I think we have to approach it with the same sort of rigor and discipline that we try and approach uh, cyber so it's got to be that people process and uh, technology but it's going to be a real big one yeah it's going to be a big big uh, big issue yeah yeah maybe and and i think yeah i agree agree completely i think it is it is a problem it's it's these iot devices you you know you can't you can't you can't embed security <clears throat> into a lot of these they're very simple devices so you know, to, to put in the types of security controls that we see at the endpoint devices today, it's not always going to be possible. Um, I think one of the things that, that we are seeing uh, much more of is, is actually regulation, changes in the regulatory environment. Um, you know, I notice a number of changes in banking uh, legislation that are starting to specifically talk about the need for cyber risk. I know that's not linked to IoT. But I wonder whether there's going to be changes in regulation that eventually is going to expand into related regulation for IoT, and that would help. But I think what would change uh, the landscape with IoT and cyber risk is when you've got, I don't know, you know, a big big organisation that prob I don't know provides white goods, for example, in the home, and uh, suddenly you know all of those devices that are you know connected to the Wi-Fi come under a ransomware attack, and you your fridges and your washing machines just don't function uh, and, and won't function. Uh, and at that point, I think that's when the industry will wake up and, and, and pay attention. Um, because, and, and I say that because, you know, you take a look back in history, unfortunately, it's still the same today. You know, an organization that gets hit with a major cyber attack, guarantee you the budget's gonna rocket the next year. Um, even though the CISO has probably been knocking on the door saying, we've got, <laughs> we've got a problem that needs to be fixed and I need money to fix it. So um, I think it's, uh, it, you know, it's that fear, uncertainty, and doubt that, um, that probably will, will, uh, will have that sort of impetus to change things in the IT environment. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Nick. And, you know, in terms of the retrospective closing of holes, you know, the, the whole Nicholas Taleb book about the unknown unknown, the black swans, or what, you know, the known unknowns, all those kind of um, permutations. But in terms of that is what tends to happen, right? You have an instant... You then get the budget the following year to, to update this, the whole or the solutions or whatever you're trying to update, the perimeter. Uh, and then something else happens the following year. And then you're constantly retrospectively, you know, solving your problems while not focusing on, you know, the future problems that might come down the road. 
And I think that's where we may be changing. And I love this thing from Sarah about will IT audit replace internal audit? Um, whereas in my days in the big four, IT audit was part of internal audit. Um, I think she means automated audit bots or something like that, potentially, that, that are able to um, you know, be on that perimeter and constantly checking around the continuous controls. Monitoring piece we mentioned. Um, I think there'll be many companies that will be happy if the auditors disappeared. <laughs> it was just a, an audit <laughs> bot or something like that. Uh, whether or not you could, you could actually rely on that, because that could be hacked, and the results of that, you know, if you rely on an automated report out of any of your IT estate, uh, you all know that that report, whoever built it, could have you know, put something in there. So the auditors have to go into that code and check that report to make sure regularly that it's not actually been back-ended and, and you know, messed around with in that side of things. So I can't see IT audit bots happening for a long time. Thanks for that, Lee. And I think we've got time for one more question. And this one is for Mike. Do I need to have both proactive and reactive automation in a cybersecurity program? Um, I think the, the short answer to that is yes. So um, proactive is going to help you uh, better prevent uh, things, but um, reactive is going to help you uh, address those and uh, react to those sort of incidents. So it's, it's having both. I don't think you can get away with uh, just one or the other. Yeah, okay. and I, I'd agree on that as well, Michael. And, you know, in the RSA days when I was working with those guys, you know, their whole paradigm shift in, in their kind of internal process was from, you know, perimeter defenses to your slide you know, earlier on to actually detection. And, and you know, the EMC got breached massively um, from somebody sitting in the hedge outside, I think, uh, for a while and hack it in. But, you know, they released that and then turned it on its head and used that as part of their development internally as, as they built uh, the company going forward. But it's really accepting that you are going to be breached. Um, but it's a question of shutting that breach down as soon as it happens or as soon as you can to make sure they've not been hiding in your systems for 12 months and, and gradually dripping stuff out of your, your um, SAP financial system or wherever they're nicking your IP or whatever if you're manufacturing. So it has shifted to detection rather than prevention. Um, and I, I can only imagine that's going to get more prevalent going forward. I'm just going to squeeze in one more question from Emmanuel, who's um, new in the field of cybersecurity. And he's saying, is there any advice on the things that he can do to develop himself in his field to become highly skilled? Ah, brilliant. Well, uh, Emmanuel, welcome to the <laughs> welcome to the world of cybersecurity. Um, I can only say great things about this industry sector. Um, you know, we are kind of, and this may sound a little bit too flowery, but I do believe we we are pioneers in this space. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's a battle that we that we all are trying to help resolve, and probably won't resolve at hundred percent. So you're definitely in a very exciting uh, field here. Um, advice on this, and um, certainly, I mean, you know, I suppose the simple advice is just to try and. Try and get out there uh, as much as you can within the business. Um, I, I do actually see the future of cybersecurity professionals <clears throat> being picked out of the business um, because I've always felt, and I've, I've often done it myself, I, I found it you know, more successful for security functions uh, to have a good balance of technical skills and non-technical skills. Um, but if we are trying to secure the business, we are in a position where we have to understand the business. And sometimes it's just not possible for security, technical security people to do that. I know myself, having come from a more of a technical background. But if you've got business analysts, business program managers, they'll have the networks, they'll have the language, they'll have the understanding. And, and they will be people that, uh, that you will you know, rely on. So get out into the business. Um, that's my key advice there. But thanks for that, Nick. Um, I'm going to have to close off the Q&A, but thank you everybody for submitting your questions and to the presenters for kindly answering them. So that's it for today's webinar. Um, I want to thank you to all the speakers and thank you to everybody for attending and participating in the polls and submitting some great questions. As mentioned at the start, the on-demand recording will be with you in a few days. And if you'd like to reach out directly to the speakers, you can find their information here. Um, lastly, during the presentation, you know, we've talked about cyber risk and the importance of being proactive in cybersecurity and the use of automation. Caveris and CRMG have partnered on a, to create a tool named the CRMGI, which essentially 
um, automates the monitoring of key cybersecurity controls. So if anybody would be interested in finding out some more information, um, we've also got a contact here of Ed Wills, um, our head of sales. So once again, um, I'd like to thank everybody and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks everybody. Have a good Christmas. Thank you.